Hello? No, I think he has to turn it on. No, not yet. Oh, we have to stay within the line. All right. Hello. Welcome. Hello, FinTech Dev. I hope you guys have all been having a wonderful FinTech DevCon. We know this uh, talk is a little bit later in the schedule, so we hope you'll keep that energy up. Um, just a few more sessions left. We are here today to talk about building FinTech APIs at scale. I have with me two co-presenters, and we'll do some quick intros first. Yeah? All right, first up, hello, I'm Lucy Shen. I'm a developer advocate at Intuit. I used to be a software engineer, mostly focusing on front-end development and QuickBooks Online for the most part. Um, nowadays, as a developer advocate, I work on mostly open source and uh, third-party as well as internal APIs. Hey, uh, my name is Suresh Muthu. I'm a principal engineer in uh, Intuit, and I work on the Intuit Data Exchange platform. So we bring in the data from data providers from outside, including uh, financial institutions, we have the data, transform, enrich, and categorize the data for all of Intuit's products. And I'm Jared Cheney. Thank you. I've been in the industry for a little over 24 years now. I'm feeling kind of old in uh, a lot of the crowds I find myself in at these conventions, but there's a lot of old timers like me as well, and I'm having some fun chatting with. I'm located in Boise, Idaho. So uh, I, I bought a dual sport motorcycle about a year and a half ago, and I'm trying to explore all the back roads. So if that's something that you share as a passion, come talk to me afterwards. I'd like to hear the specs on your bike. Uh, but I'm very passionate about APIs, a lot, uh, lot of history working with trying to get things to talk with one another. And I love it when it's easy, and uh, it's, it's always challenging and fun when it's hard to try and make it better. So. Awesome. OK, thank you for your intros. I'm going to. Briefly take over here. <laughs> we have an agenda for you, so you know what to expect. So let's talk four, four main parts, right? First up, I'm going to be defining what an API program is for you all. That's a pretty vague term, so I'm going to give you some clarity. Um, Jared is going to go over how we defined our API guidelines after that. Uh, Suresh is going to cover the tooling, automations, a demo of all of that. It was it's really good. Look forward to that. <laughs> and then I'm also going to come back at the end and cover a bit of the training and community aspects of our API program. So that being said, uh, before all that, rather, First up, if you have not heard of Intuit before, we are a global financial technology platform. All that really means is we own these products and we build these products. Um, you may have heard of especially TurboTax and QuickBooks and MailChimp before. A lot of these are acquisitions as well, but we do build them. Um, and so we do support 100 million customers worldwide, and that is our, that's the scale. That's, we're, we're all about that scale. So APIs at scale, 2023 tax peak, our most recent tax peak. Um, across all of our APIs, through our API gateway this, this past tax peak's tax season, uh, we had 71.4 billion transactions run through the API gateway overall. That's across everything, with a max transactions per second of 630,000, roughly. Out of that very large pool, we have some GraphQL specific numbers that I want to highlight because there has been sort of concerted push across the industry to get more GraphQL adoption um, overall, right? So for us, that was 56 million transactions with a max TPS of 663. So compared to the all APIs numbers, like they look, you know, they pale a little in comparison. We're still early in the journey. I think a lot of us are. Um, and that's partially what we're covering today is how we're trying to get that up and going a little bit more. So I hope those numbers are impressive to you all. <laughs> they are to me. They are very large numbers, um, especially during tax season. It's an especially scary time at Intuit. But uh, for us, having healthy APIs that can really scale to that degree is the most important part. So I'm going to step back a little bit before we really, in order to define an API program for you all, I'm going to show you guys where we are in the Intuit journey, actually. So Intuit is not a young company by any means, um, especially in the tech sphere. We're, we're almost like a dinosaur, actually. We were founded in 1983, um, which means that our code base uh, was also founded in 1983. And the APIs do sometimes reflect that, unfortunately. And so for us, in recent years, a conversation we've been having again and again and now really coming to fruition is this idea that we have a lot of internal APIs. They're obviously very robust. Those numbers I just flashed at you just now, those are, those are real scale numbers. Um, how do we take those internal APIs, which up until now, we've only called ourselves and make them available to the wider audience, to the wider world? How can you guys all get access to our APIs? And how can we do that in a way that's healthy for the business? <laughs> um, so that's where the API program is really important. We have to make sure that we have a robust set of standards. We have a way to govern and steward those standards. And then how do we continue to like, push that forward? Right? Things are always changing. How do we keep those up to date and continue to be healthy? So that's, that's what our API program is. It breaks down into a few key components. We have guidelines, tooling, and learning programs. Uh, you may have noticed that this mirrors our agenda. So we're going to be diving into each of these components separately. Um, and I, I'll pass it off then to Jared to cover our guidelines. Thank you, Lucy. So 
Uh, let's talk about guidelines, everybody's favorite topic. Sometimes it can be a good topic, sometimes a very uh, fraught with peril when it comes to discussing these, but I want to talk a little bit about the why first. So as Lucy mentioned, we are on a journey at Intuit. We're trying to freshen or refresh our internal APIs. We're trying to replace and update our external APIs. We're trying to expose more things externally than we offer today. A lot of our internal things, we're trying to make it available to others to be able to leverage and, and benefit from. And it's caused us to have a lot of conversations internally over the last year, one to two years, about what do we keep doing, what do we stop doing, and what do we need to start doing to make this successful. And whenever we start talking about guidelines or rules or things, I, I recall this quote from the Pirates of the Caribbean. So you're probably familiar with this. Uh, Elizabeth Turner is the character. She's out on the pirate ship, the Black Pearl, and she's ta talking to Captain Barbosa, trying to broker a deal for the safety of her town. Come to what she feels is a satisfactory uh, conclusion to that deal, and then she says, okay, go drop me back off at shore. And she says, oh, you, I'm not taking you back to shore. That wasn't part of the deal. And she's like, so she invokes the code, the pirate codes. You have to. It's the rules. She says, well... I hate to tell you this, but the code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. And so the point of this is that even if you have the best guidelines, the best rules and everything in the world and everybody is actually following those guidelines, you're still not going to get it right. Uh, you're not going to get it right in your first time and probably not in your second or third times as well. And so you need some kind of principles or framework within which to assess where are the places where we need to slow down and kind of really look at this versus we can go fast and it doesn't really matter what we do because we can come back and fix it later. And so I'm going to talk about some of those principles and frameworks, more high level stuff that hopefully are useful no matter what size you are at in your company, but things that you can implement while you're small. It'll benefit when you're big. If you're already big, maybe they'll help you get out some of the mess that you're dealing with. And Suresh is going to talk about the tooling that helps us keep on track. And then Lucy's going to talk about the how we work together to make sure that uh, this is a successful program moving forward. So that brings us to this principle here. Uh, may be familiar to you. I'll give you a really quick, uh, real quick overview of what this is. Identifying what we call a two-way door decision versus a one-way door decision and trying to identify those early in your path on any kind of generation of an API schema or, or program. One-way door decision, obvious. It's, you can't go back through. Once you've gone through it, it's very difficult or impossible to reverse that kind of a decision. A two-way door decision is something where you can be like Kramer who comes through that door, you know, fast and hard, and he's looking around and he's just ready to go, and it's really quick for him to get back out and, and uh, change his mind and come back differently the next time. So with uh, two-way versus one-way door decisions, I came to Intuit by way of an acquisition. I worked for T-Sheets, which is a time tracking software company. Back in the very early days, I was one of the first engineers working on that product. We grew it, built it into something awesome, and then we were eventually acquired by Intuit about 10 years into our journey. Now, if you had told me on day, you know, the first couple of months when we were making decisions about how we built our APIs and did things, that those APIs would still be in use today, uh, 15 plus years later, I said, oh, come on. We know that uh, what we're building here is not going to be durable enough or necessary enough to stick around then. We'll, we'll have made improvements and changes by then. But no, those APIs are still in use today. And uh, some of the decisions we made with those APIs, I regret still to this day. <laughs> uh, but they're serving the need, and, and they're, they're operating, and nothing is broken. It's just that I would have done things a little bit differently had I had a little bit more wisdom and maturity at the time that we made those decisions. And so. Understanding what is a one-way door, what is a two-way door, even if you're at that stage where it's just you and your co-founder looking at doing things, as soon as you start bringing on customers that rely upon whatever you're exposing to them, the degree of difficulty and coordination required to change them away from what they had been doing to something new grows exponentially as you bring on more and more customers. So in our journey, we, we did up-version our API twice, the first one I don't really count though because we were the only consumers of it, so that was very easy. We were able to coordinate internally and do it all just fine. The second time we did it, we had quite a few customers, um, but it wasn't too bad. We knew a lot of them on almost a first name basis. We spoke to them regularly. We had a good email communication uh, pattern with them. And so we were able to coordinate 
and let them know, hey, this is coming. We're going to maintain the old one for such an amount of time, you know, six months. Then you need to roll the new one. We had uh, everything built out. It was still small enough. We knew what had to be offered in that new one uh, to cover all of the feature and capabilities that were in the old one. And it went off fairly smoothly, but it was painful uh, even then at that small size. Fast forward another five or six years, and any time it came up, with uh, the, the concept of up-versioning our API. I'm like, well, okay, you're looking at least at a 12 to 18 month process at the minimum to be able to do that if you truly want everybody off of that old one and moving on to the new one. So think about what is one way versus a two way. Don't scare, I'm not trying to scare you. <laughs> move forward, you know, make, make the decisions to move forward. You can, everything is truly a two way door if you have enough time and resources, it just gets more difficult. But uh, when you can recognize that this is a piece of our solution that is a contract, something that others are going to be uh, consuming. Those are the times to slow down, make sure you've got some good people in the room and take your time making the decision on what patterns you're gonna adopt, uh, what you're gonna be doing going forward so that you'll hopefully not have to make any changes or very little changes to it going forward. Other things like what tech stack fuels it and whatever's going on in the back end, those are a lot easier to make adjustments to. So how do you uh, go about identifying one and then dealing with those one-way door decisions, especially as you begin to grow? I don't know about the rest of y'all, but when it, was, uh, when it was just me and three other guys building, it was very easy to make decisions because we all thought alike and, and we were very similar in our philosophy and how we approach things. But as soon as we started growing beyond that three to four uh, person company and we, had, we doubled in size to eight, you know, uh, we had some different differences of opinions, and sometimes it wasn't possible to resolve those uh, decisions easily, and we spent a lot of time talking and talking and talking and never coming to a, a final resolution uh, in those early days. And this is one of the big benefits that I've learned from the growth that we have, but then also within Intuit and some of the tools that they've uh, taught me since I've been there. And one is called DACI, that's D-A-C-I. It's very important to have a driver of a decision. You need an approver identified. It should only be one person that's the approver. Your contributors, the C, and then those that are informed. And you establish that DACI anytime you come up against one of these big decisions or these uh, decision points that you're trying to resolve. And with that, you might still not get everybody in agreement, but when you do get together, everybody knows that there's one approver and that approver is going to participate potentially in the conversations, but at the very least have some kind of a proposal presented to them. And when that proposal is there, they can make a decision quickly. And everybody, even though they may disagree, everybody commits and that's what we do going forward. So it helps unblock and do things. And it's helpful to have a framework of some sort. You can see here, this is our spreadsheet that we started to track how others in the industry decided whether to use kebab case or snake case in the URL portion of the <laughs> resources. I see some people out there responding to this. I'm sure you've had these kind of conversations. Uh, come talk to me later if you want to know what we chose and why. <laughs> Happy to share that. But uh, this is an example of how we would go about. Usually, you get a large group of people debating or at least having opinions and sometimes cross-talking. Make an assignment to two, maybe three people max to go away and come up with a point of view and come back and present it to the group and have discussion. Try not to, to uh, decide any of these things in larger than a two or three group, uh, group of people. And then if everybody can get aligned, that's when you say, okay, now we'll go ahead and we'll propose it to the decision approver and we'll move forward. And out of all of this comes this guidelines wiki that we have internally and we are covering a lot of the guidelines, practices, patterns that we want for both REST API, GraphQL API, gRPC, uh, and then just general principles for services and how we want to present those to the teams. And this is something that we're actually looking to try and open source at some point, just in case anybody else might benefit from having these set of guidelines that we're using and, and have kind of a contribution model for people that want to suggest changes and so on. We aren't quite there yet, but again, that's something that we are looking to do and happy to put you on a list of those that I'll Slack or, or message via LinkedIn if you're interested. So the thing to recognize though is that some topics take more time. So a show of hands, if you have spent one hour or more discussing any of these topics with somebody in your organization, please raise your hand. <laughs> okay, OK, 
Okay, so I think either we've got some non-developers in here or people might not have been listening on that question because that's like everybody would probably have their hands raised on this, right? So from our experience, like uh, Lucy said, we've been on this journey for a little over a year now in terms of just trying to get these guidelines solidified and then communicated out and trained to our teams. These are the ones that I picked as like the ones to watch out for. They will take more time. So start the conversations early, come up with your point of view early and so on. Error handling, what I will say about that is that what I have found, this is my opinion, the most important thing to keep in mind when it comes to error handling is being able to easily differentiate in what you return to the consumer, whether this is something that the user, the consumer, not of the API, but of the application, is, should be concerned about and may be able to do something about, or is this something that the developer should be concerned about and needs to do something about? An example is a user might care that a timesheet is going to be longer than a 24-hour period when you can only have 24 hours in a day. That just doesn't work, so please enter your details and try again. The developer can stay out of that uh, fight because they haven't done anything wrong in how they've implemented your API, but the user needs to have that information. You need to have an easy way for the developer to know, oh, just pass this message up to the user. Developer facing, you know, depending upon your API, this might be really simple. It might be like, hey, you're not, you're, you're voiding the contract. You're not following the schema. That's a syntax error. Or it might be something like you're trying to request more in this page of uh, results than we allow you to. So you need to change your code and try again. Namespacing. This is taken care of automatically a lot of the time with you know things like RESTful APIs. But with GraphQL, this can become a thing when you're trying to combine multiple segments, uh, graphs into a single federated graph. You need some way to be able to establish areas of autonomy within your schema so that the, the QuickBooks Money Group or the QuickBooks Time Group or the QuickBooks Payroll Group, they can all work on their own areas of that graph and that schema without having to worry about and coordinating with the other segments and, and dealing with conflicts in terms of names of types and things like that. So namespacing can be a, a big deal. And what you use is that namespace, trying to make it apparent to external consumers what it is versus internal names or acronyms that only the internal company is going to know. Naming conventions. Uh, what is it they say that the three hardest problems within computer science are naming, um, off by one errors, and uh, what was the other one? Cache eviction. What's that? Cache eviction. Cache eviction, that's right. <laughs> Busting your cache, naming, and uh, something else. Anyway, that was supposed to be a really great <laughs> joke because the off by one error, I should have said the four things. I listed th <laughs> and then listed three. But uh, then the final one here, how to orchestrate services. This is how much burden are you going to put on your clients uh, by saying, we are going to give you all the APIs to do what you need, but you're going to have to call 20 of them to do that thing. And it's up to you to figure out how to take the results of all those 20 APIs and orchestrate the logic that needs to take place for you to accomplish your flow. Or are we going to offer you a single Uber API or a few single uh, Uber APIs that take care of all that for you on the back end so that your uh, calling case is very simple? One's very hard for the API provider, one's very hard for the consumer, and usually it's some kind of in between, but establishing early on kind of what your philosophy is on that will help you as you set out to define your APIs. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Suresh. He's gonna talk about some of the tooling that we do to take care of this. Awesome. Thanks, Janet. After the initial guidelines are established, uh, we always pay attention to the feedback that we get from our customers who are our Intuit developers to keep those guidelines updated. We, we want to make sure that like the users of the guidelines are using it right and uh, any other uh, guidelines, we keep them uh, updated. And the initial set of uh, guidelines, uh, after the initial set of guidelines, we channeled our energies into developing automation uh, and, and tooling and um, this this topic we will talk about like uh, about those uh, the tools that we have uh, developed. We want to develop uh, tools that will help our developers throughout the entire API development lifecycle. We want to help them with our um, uh, the the during the design phase uh, and the development phase of those APIs uh, when they want to review the API. We want to help with uh, those toolings as well as 
when they are ready to publish those APIs, we want to provide those toolings. Uh, with that, here is our uh, API tooling ecosystem. Uh, we have templates, the code templates, that follow the API guidelines that Jared was talking about. So those are baked in into the template. So when you're starting a new service or a new API service, these guidelines are already baked in. So you are already seeing these uh, guidelines that we have established in the code. Uh, we'll talk about more about that. And we also wanted to uh, help our developers during the design and development phase. We developed tools around uh, including uh, plugin IDEs. So as and when you are modifying or creating your API spec, we are applying and validating the API spec the developer is editing against the guidelines that we have developed. And all of these tools and uh, uh, plugins are backed by our central service, call it the API governance service or the validation service. Uh, and after all of this automated tooling, we also have our community-driven uh, API JIRAs to uh, review uh, the schemas. And during the entire phase of our uh, API development, we want to pay special attention to documentation. Uh, documentation as part of the API uh, spec itself, be it, uh, be it an open API spec or a GraphQL API uh, schema. We want to make sure that the documentation is uh, in there in the spec enabling our uh, documentation to be auto-generated from the API spec. Let's, let's go into these uh, in uh, each of these areas, the code templates. The code templates that, that we have, uh, Intuit has been uh, for doing this for a while, so our code templates are super mature, but even for a startup, we want to have a, a template that follows the guidelines. So. Uh, the templates that we have are up to date with our API guidelines and best practices. We have uh, the guidelines uh, in the template as well as the Jenkins uh, jobs that runs the linters against the API spec. And we have uh, the, the implementation of that code, the testing, the unit testing, and the integration testing, all of them are baked into the code that adhere to our guidelines, and that helps the developer. So when you are coming into a company with an engineer, is your first day, you have the guidelines that are baked into uh, the code that you are trying to write. And to help further, we automated uh, the validations. Uh, we developed plugins for IDEs. We currently have Visual Studio Code and IntelliJ um, uh, plugins that will validate the uh, editor uh, and the OpenAPI spec. We'll see a demo of this uh, soon. Uh, and also we developed a GitHub app uh, that validates the pull request as soon as it's submitted. Uh, and uh, we are using the tools and make them available for uh, our uh, developers internally so that they can use the standalone tool uh, and these tools are, uh, I'll give an example. Uh, we, we developed uh, custom linter rules, our open API specific linter rules that follows our guidelines. So we extended from uh, the common set of guidelines and linter that we have, then added our own custom uh, linters on top of that. And uh, all the tools and linters, uh, are backed by this API governance service. This is the brain behind uh, the plugins and tools. So, and that service pulls the latest data from uh, the definitions of the linters and the rules, and they are used consistently across uh, the tools and linters, like whether it's an IDE or it is a local standalone tool that we are using, or if it is uh, the, the, the PR, the pull request review, the automated review, all of them are backed by these standal, uh, this governance service. Uh, enough talk, let's uh, see a demo of like, you know, how uh, these are being done in Jit. So the template that I talked about here is a template we allow the user to go and create in our developer portal. Uh, you specify uh, the service that you're trying, trying, trying to bring up and uh, we, as I said, like Intuit is uh, mature in this area. So we have REST APIs, GraphQL and other, other services uh, and they come up with the entire uh, spec uh, and uh, the Jenkins job that runs the uh, linters and uh, also the uh, 
uh, automated test, integration test, all, all of them are, are, are in the uh, code template. Okay. Uh, the code template, after the service is generated from uh, these, uh, these, uh, these code templates, we have, uh, here, here's an example of like how uh, generated code would look like. So it comes up with a default open API spec. I chose uh, REST API, so it comes with a default API spec with the documentation and everything baked in and uh, pass it here. So uh, some of the guidelines that we have are already uh, in, in this example open API spec that we have. Uh, things like uh, we want to specify uh, a default value or a maximum and minimum value for for a header parameter, for example, is already baked in. So you are you are when you are editing uh, this this file to add more fields, you are following the same kind of guidelines, and we are we want to help our developers with that. Um, and uh, the implementation part of that is also uh, in, in the uh, in the template. Uh, here is an example of our REST API controller that follows our API first approach, going from our Open API spec and implementing that in, in the service. So all of these uh, implementation uh, are also baked in here, along with the testing, integration testing, to make this build successful and to be able to ready to deploy in, uh, in your environment. And uh, during the development, they said like we want to help our developers with um, uh, API spec on the guidelines. One of our guidelines says uh, use uh, snake case for uh, URL path parameters that uh, Jared mentioned. And if you are trying to change that to a different uh, naming convention, our uh, IDE plugin will specify, will mark that and flag that as an error or a warning depending on uh, the severity of that error. And these are all baked in into uh, uh, in, into the IDE uh, plugin itself. Here's an, another example, uh, error code, we want consistent error code across our APIs, across the products. Uh, our error code standard says each error, when we are returning to the user, it should have code as one of the fields. If you are trying to change that or without that or trying to modify that, that results uh, in, in the validation error and we want to provide more uh, detail about that, so we will link this error to the guidelines that Jared showed to our wiki uh, to provide more detail about our errors. And all of these uh, validations are also part of our uh, GitHub and pull request reviews. So we have developed a GitHub app that runs the same validation that you would do in our uh, Jenkins job or in, uh, in the uh, IDE, this bot goes and reviews the open API spec. If there's an open API spec, or uh, we're also working on the GraphQL uh, schema, and it runs the validation against the guidelines that we have and records changes uh, for that PR already automated. So even before we take it to uh, our uh, peers for review, we want to make sure that like these guidelines are validated in, in the GitHub app. But any of these uh, tooling and automation can help to a certain extent. This will help us get us the consistent APIs, but we want to make sure that our APIs are not only consistent, but they are consumable. There's a big difference between consistent APIs and making sure that these APIs are consumable by uh, uh, the API uh, consumers. So for that, we have uh, established uh, uh, a community uh, to go through and get a human review of uh, the API spec. Uh, I'll hand it over to Lucy to talk about our uh, community and the review. All right, perfect. Okay, let's talk training and community. So we have a whole bunch of guidelines now. We have a lot of ways to automate, whether we check those, how we check those guidelines rather, make it a little easier. 
Um, but how do you make them real? Like, how do you get your developer community to take these seriously, actually? So the funny answer to this is peer pressure. <laughs> uh, the more serious answer is you make the peer pressure kind of fun, and you make the peer pressure kind of like full of glory. And so we created something called the Jedi program. It sure feels full of glory, doesn't it, to be called a Jedi? Um, honestly, that's just our cute name for a very standard champions program. If you've been in a champions program before, if you've run one before, you know what a champions program is. And if you don't, it's basically a way to get it so that everyone who uses your platform or tool or library, whatever it is, uh, becomes an advocate of that tool or library or project, whatever. Um, they become the people who help you answer questions and field support requests, actually, so that your development team can focus on building the actual product and then your power users help each other out, right? So that's what a cha the ideal goal of a champions program is. So for us here at Intuit, currently at least, it is uh, mostly internally focused. And as of yesterday, actually, we finally launched it. Um, it's been in the works for a long time. Um, so it's very exciting that it's finally live, but this is very relevant also for, especially to those of you who have external developer communities, because all the same problems apply. It's just that we're a large enough company that it also applies internally. Um, so for us, our API Jedi, are largely governance focused. Um, that top bullet point says that we're a company-wide program. What I mean by that is we have Jedi all over the company for all the different like subject areas. So APIs are only one of them. We also have Cloud Jedi, Front End Jedi, Security Jedi, you name it, right? They exist, um, or rather they're all in the works. We're the first one to launch. Um, but our API Jedi are specifically governance focused, by which we mean they conduct, as we mentioned earlier, the schema reviews. Um, for now, that's the main thing, uh, as well as fielding support requests. And then the process of getting people into the Jedi program is about training, nomination, shadowing, right? This is about career growth also and up-leveling your skills. So there's a draw to join the program as well. As I said, there's glory in it. Um, and this is actually our second time trying to put together a Jedi program at Intuit. Uh, the last one, I'm not gonna say it failed, actually it was very successful, but it did end, and so we'll talk about that later. So let's uh, put yourself in a Jedi shoes. Do they, they definitely wear shoes. Uh, <laughs> that took me a moment. Um, put yourself in their shoes, and let's say, let's say you're a fairly junior, maybe mid-career developer. Um, you are looking into becoming like your team's API expert, and you're, you've heard about this Jedi program, you wanna get into it. So what does that experience feel like? Um, the first step is to complete a self-serve training that we have put together. Self-serve because we don't want to gatekeep knowledge, right? We made this beautiful training and we want as many people, whether you want to become a Jedi or not, um, to take this training because it means that everyone who touches our APIs, which hopefully is every developer at the company, they will just like write better code, write better APIs. Um, so the self-serve training comes in three parts. First part is general API guidelines, second is REST API, and third is GraphQL API. Obviously there are lots of other types of APIs. <laughs> These are the two that we're focusing on for now. Um, and they're beautiful. I, I wish I could show it to you, but um, they were built based off the guidelines decided by Jared and Suresh. So um, they're currently like little video modules with um, hopefully we'll have tech segments to go with it too. And also a very, very actually rigorous uh, quiz at the end of each module. So once you pass all that, um, and let's say you want to continue to be a mentor, uh, sorry, a Jedi, um, we will assign you a mentor, and also you'll get to shadow them and do some homework assignments, which are a lot more in-depth. So rather than like watching some videos and taking a quiz, you're actually like spinning up APIs, basically. We want you to prove that you're worth your medal and you know what you're talking about, because the next step is you take your Jedi oath and you become a fully-fledged Jedi Knight, and now you are committing to an ongoing review rotation. This is where all the work actually happens is in step three right here. This is the reason we want a Jedi program, right? Because these are the guys going into our Slack channels, going into the community support channels, answering everybody's godforsaken repetitive questions. <laughs> and they're the ones making the developers team's life, like everybody's lives easier. Um, but it's not easy. It's actually kind of burnouty, which is why it's a rotation. So you're not stuck doing that for too long. You can actually focus on your development work. Because the thing to remember here is that all these Jedi have day jobs. Like this is just the thing they do on the side for glory, um, but you know, mostly just because they're part of this community and they want to contribute something to it. It's very intrinsically motivated, but we don't want them to burn out on that. We want them to do good work outside of that too. So that's why it's a rotation. And then also, because we always need fresh mindsets and fresh minds, actually, on this program, we ask them also to help recruit and mentor. A lot of times this comes from your power users, right? As you do fulfill your Jedi duties, you find, oh, this like, same set of three to five people keep you know, coming in and asking really advanced questions actually. They've gotten really deep into our product. Um, let's ask them to become Jedi next. So that's kind of what the experience looks like. Um, and I hope, while I know that with Intuit, we're a very large company, we obviously need this kind of thing internally, but I hope I've justified enough to you all why this is important also for especially actually external developer communities. Um, so 
While setting up this program, there were a lot of considerations. I've set it up at a very high level checklist for you all if you're interested in setting up something like this. Uh, managing people programs like this is very strange and squishy. It feels very much like cat herding. <laughs> and so these checklists are meant to make it feel a little more concrete for you. I'm not gonna read it all out, but I wanna point out three main bullet points here. The first is sustainability and burnout. As I already mentioned, as I already mentioned um, there's a lot going on in everyone's lives. Uh, actually, the last time I mentioned we had a Jedi program that kind of fizzled out, it was a migration uh, program program basically. So we were trying to get people onto Kubernetes <laughs> and trying to do that migration was hell on earth. So we had a Jedi program set up to help people help each other through that. Once the migration was completed, the need for a Jedi program felt less important, even though there was actually a lot of work left to do. And it was kind of a waste to let a community like that go. And so now we're trying to set up sort of V2 of the program. Um, so that's, that's kind of a demonstration of why sustainability is important to think about and what your next steps are. And that's where the fresh, that flywheel, that rotation is really important to keep things going. You don't want to lose your momentum because after you've put in all this work for a program, letting it go to waste would be pretty sad. Uh, the next thing I want to point out is the fourth bullet point on the left side, which is balancing high standards versus open access. We've talked a lot about guidelines and enforcing them. Enforcing is a very harsh word. Uh, we did get a lot of feedback early on that people did not like feeling bossed around. <laughs> and that's important to us because we don't want API owners, we want them to feel like owners, right? We don't want to feel like we're policing them. That's not the point of having guidelines. The guidelines are meant to accelerate them, not to slow them down. We're not here to cause friction, we're here to help you make better APIs faster. So that's the point of, you want to set high standards, you want them to be good. You want everyone to hopefully follow the same standards, um, but you want them to feel like they have authority and and access to everything they need to, to own that API themselves and make their own decisions. Um, so that balance is quite tricky and it's I don't have you know a formula for you or anything. It's just something to keep in mind. The last one, last bullet point, internal versus external APIs. This is how we opened the whole talk. This is what spurred the discussion for us in the first place. Um, for a lot of companies, for a lot of people, for a lot of teams, you're starting with your APIs internally for the most part, and you don't even imagine a future where they're ever going to become external. Um, we are, we fell in that trap, right? <laughs> and so now we have to have this huge conversation about how we get our internal APIs up to a level where they're external ready. Thankfully, we're also building new APIs, fresh APIs every day. And so now we can approach those APIs with an external first mindset so that they're robust from the get-go and we don't have to do this conversation again. So um, starting out with that mindset, will help you a lot in the long run. Even if even if you never end up taking an external, it will be a healthier, more robust API to begin with because you had that in mind. So it um, basically, it's kind of like open source and versus inner source, if you guys have heard that terminology. The mindset of like being external accessible makes it so that your code is more accessible for internal people as well. It goes both ways. So please, <laughs> we have a demo ready. Actually, if you'd like to try some of our little baby APIs out, um, we have a, that QR code leads to the link tree. There's a link at the top if you'd like to get early access, uh, please do. We also have our open source libraries as well as our Intuit developer GitHubs both on there. So there's two GitHub organizations um, and a whole bunch of other resources and things. Uh, we actually featured some of our GraphQL open source projects there as well in case they're helpful for you. Um, yeah, I, I hope this was a very helpful talk. We tried to make it like a playbook for you all. So if you need any resources from us, we're also happy to share whatever we can, right? Same QR code. Uh, you didn't miss anything. Our socials are at the bottom too, so get in touch if you need to. And uh, if you have any questions, it looks like we have like six minutes. So thank you very much for coming. Yes, please. Uh, yes, yeah, so we did look at uh, uh, the tools that are available, uh, both open source and uh, uh, the, the paid uh, services. None, none of them fit exactly what we are looking for. Right? Like we wanted to start with uh, uh, the APIs that followed the guidelines, but the custom uh, rule set that we wanted to define uh, was what we wanted to uh, build, and also, uh, what we call it is intuitism uh, in Intuit. Like there are a lot of ecosystems that are built around. So uh, the tools that we are looking for need to work with the other tools uh, you know, that we have in Intuit. So uh, so we ended up building our own instead of going for uh, another third party company. How often is there a need for Uh, 
I'll speak first, and Lucy, if you want to add, feel free. The, the goal is by becoming a Jedi, we trust you with your domain. So the idea is that they have enough knowledge and guidance now to be able to operate within the context of their domain and make the decisions without needing to raise it up to that higher level, which is the more the Jedi review or the council is kind of how we term that. Um, so we're still feeling that out. And we basically, when we have a lot of Slack channels where there's a lot of debate and, and conversation, the questions going on. So in everything goes through phases. If it's somebody's first entry into our federated graph, for example, for our GraphQL API, there's gonna be a lot more review up front, but then as they get more comfortable, we get more comfortable and everybody understands, becomes less and less necessary until they're introducing maybe a new entity or some different pattern in their mutations or things like that. So anything to add, Lucy? Okay. So as, as little as possible, but no less than that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. How do you determine the handle, or I, I should ask, how many external handles does your application have? I, I can speak to that if you'd like. Okay. Uh, externally handling API deprecation, very broadly, what we would say is we, we generally try to give an 18 month deprecation window. Uh, we try to shorten that if we can, depending upon how many people are using the API. So we'll start first with a notice of some sort saying, hey, guess what? We're going to be turning this off in 18 months. So when we do that, we try to have the alternative ready at that time that we send out the communication. We found that if we wait to say, and, and we'll get you the new one in six months, people are like, well, then the 18 months needs to start then, and it becomes a debate back and forth. So try to have the alternative to replace the same functionality ready first, communicate there's an 18 month deprecation, and then be prepared for when you get within six months to have uh, conversations and negotiations with your biggest partners who need extensions. And you've got to then decide how much longer do we let this out. So it can sometimes be a two plus year journey depending upon the scope of what you're trying to deprecate. I don't know if how that compares with your experience or thoughts, but. Yeah, they're very similar. The concern is Yeah, very good point. And one of the thoughts I believe is in that 18 month time frame is most companies have some kind of a beginning or ending year planning. And so if you only give them 12 months or less, then they're like, we've already got our plan and our roadmap set for the year and you're throwing this on us now. So it's like giving you 18 months, you've got kind of a six month window within which to start planning and thinking about it and then kick that off as one of your initiatives. But that's a good call out on the, the risk of attrition your process. Great questions. Any, any others? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.